Ladies and gentlemen, my name is George Thanos, and I am the president of CSEO. In the next decades, space exploration is set to grow in a profound way. Already, space activities are visibly gearing up to an impressive level, with the private sector starting to take a much more prominent role. We see large corporations making plans and announcements for bold and inspiring goals, reaching to the moon, to Mars, and further. We see more and more countries joining the race, and the space workforce of the future could be you. This is why we have asked some of the top experts in cosmology, astronomy, and space engineering to share with us their views on what the future of space exploration will bring the next decade up to 2030. We're starting our series with fundamental questions. What is our universe made of? Black holes and the Big Bang. For this first episode, we have with us the founding father of quantum gravity, one of the world's top cosmologists. We're continuing the next episodes with a journey to the Moon and Mars. We ask questions on life in the universe. So let's talk about today's first episode. Our series, 2030 Spaceworks, premieres with Sir Roger Penrose. You heard that everything in this universe, including time, started with a Big Bang. Or did it? So if time started with a Big Bang, can we really ask, was there something before the Big Bang? What are black holes? And what's their role in the development of the universe? Are black holes a doorway to something? Sir Roger Penrose has some intriguing answers and compelling evidence to these cosmological questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we're truly delighted and honored to have with us today a legend of cosmology, Sir Roger Penrose, to premiere our 2030 Space Work series. He's one of the world's most prominent theoretical physicists, who in 1965 produced the mathematics that showed how stars collapse to form black holes. With Stephen Hawking, he showed that if Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity is correct, then there would be a singularity, a point of infinite density and space-time curvature, where time has a beginning. Penrose shared the prestigious Wolf Prize for Physics with Stephen Hawking for this work on the Penrose-Hawking singularity theorem. Penrose is known as the founding father of quantum gravity through his work on twister theory which addresses the geometry of space-time. He's an emeritus professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford and the author of several books about the nature of space, time, and reality. His theories touch existential matters, such as the fabric and creation of the universe. So let us welcome him and listen to what he has to share with us. Sir Roger Penrose, Good afternoon and welcome to our presentation. I understand we have very interesting things to talk to us about today. I hope so. <laughs> so we're all full of ears. Please, uh, we are ready to hear your presentation. Well, let me first talk about the universe as a whole as we currently understand it. And so we have a picture of the evolution of the universe. This is a space-time picture. Time is upwards and of course we can't represent all three dimensions of space but you have to imagine that that surface you see is really three-dimensional space. At the bottom we have the Big Bang which is supposed to be the origin of our universe and then you see it expands and expands and slightly starts slowing down a bit and that's then it starts to increase at the top, we see the exponential expansion, which is now observed from the observations of supernovae stars, and their recession from us is seen from the redshift, and we see that the universe is starting to indulge in this exponential expansion. Exponential means that it's self-similar in its expansion, and we have begin, begun to see this phenomenon. It's consistent with Einstein's equations when he introduced his what he called his lambda term which he introduced 
and then retracted. He introduced it because he didn't want an expanding universe. He thought he'd like much like prefer a universe that was static. And in order to make a static universe, you had to introduce this extra term, which is the lambda term. But then the observations of Hubble became more convincing and it became clear that the universe actually was expanding. So Einstein retracted his lambda term and cons considered this to be his greatest blunder. Well, the irony of this is even his blunders turn out to be true because the cosmological constant in a slightly different context gives this expansion of the universe, this exponential expansion, which we currently see. And Einstein's lambda term introduced in 1917, he introduced the general theory in 1915 and then the lambda term which he then hastily retracted for the wrong reason. He introduced it for the wrong reason and then retracted it because he didn't know that the expanding universe, exponential expanding universe seemed to be what is observed at least now much later than he knew about of course. Okay, now I want to say something which is also conventional in current uh, cosmology. We look now at the beginning of the universe and I want to look very carefully at this and for that I'll need a, a very powerful magnifying glass which I hope you can see and now what you see in this magnifying glass is another exponential expansion according to current theory. This is what they call the inflationary phase which is introduced for certain reasons, they're good reasons, but I never really took to it. I thought it was not a very convincing thing to have this exponential expansion. You can compare the exponential expansion at the beginning that you see with the magnifying glass and the exponential expansion that we now see for the very much later universe that we are currently seeing and it's very very similar. They, people introduce this inflationary phase because in the cosmic microwave background, I'll have a lot to say about that later, this is observation of uh, microwave signals from the very early universe which really convinced people of the Big Bang in fact that was the first convincing evidence that the universe did start from this very explosive initial state and expanded and this is now uh, one of the features of this is the temperature fluctuations. The temperature is not exactly, it's very very uniform but not exactly uniform and there are slight deviations from this uniformity in temperature and these deviations have a very curious feature that they're what's called scale invariant. That is if you magnify the scale you see the same temperature variations as on the small scale. As on the large scale and then the small scale you see the same temperature variations. So this is very puzzling to people and there, people try to find all sorts of explanations for this and the only explanation that people come up, could come up with was this inflationary early stage which is self-similar and it therefore has this characteristic that the large and the small fluctuations look the same. Now I'll come back to inflation shortly but let me next um, talk about the remote future. So I want to talk about infinity and you'll see from this picture I have of the history of the universe as we currently understand it with inflation right tucked in at the beginning and at the back I have a rather sort of imprecise kind of wiggly frilly thing, what's that for? Well I really want to say that I'm not trying to prejudice the issue as to whether the universe is open or closed. You see it looks with this picture at first sight that it's closed spatially, it sort of goes around into itself, but it may not. It may continue indefinitely. In fact current view, belief is that it does continue indefinitely. So right at the back I say well we don't really know, maybe it keeps on going, maybe it closes up, or maybe it's what's called hyperbolic geometry and these three kinds of geometry I've illustrated in the Escher pictures that I have. These are three pictures, wonderful uh, tessellations due to the Dutch artist M.C. Escher and you see he's used these angels and devils to illustrate the symmetries of these three different uh, kinds of spatial geometry. It could be the flat space geometry I think at the top left where you see this just Euclidean geometry or you see this curved up geometry which is like the sphere, you imagine that in higher number of dimensions which is closed up spatially or you can have what's called hyperbolic which is sort of more 
more open, if you like, than even the, the flat space geometry. I'll come back to that later for a particular reason. But I first of all wanted to explain the frilly bit at the back of my picture. Now let's think about the inflationary thing again. Now you see, one of the reasons, I won't mention one reason for inflation, they wanted to explain the um, the uh, scale invariance of the fluctuations, but another reason is that people wanted to try and explain why uniform, why it's so uniform. The universe is very uniform, remarkably uniform, and uh, one of the reasons for inflation, so people thought, was that if you introduce this exponential expansion, any kind of irregularity will simply be ironed out completely when it gets to the sort of scale we see now. So that was one reason also for inflation. Now I've never believed that reason, and one of the reasons that I don't believe it, you see they introduced this thing called the inflaton field in order to make it work, this is a, a sort of artificial field just introduced to make inflation work, that's all it's for. Um, now I want to consider does it really smooth out the universe? And to understand this, let's think of time going in the opposite direction. So now I've turned my picture upside down, so now you see time going upwards still, but now the universe is collapsing. And this is one of the pictures that people have for perhaps the remote future of the universe that will collapse. But you have to imagine there will now be irregularities, there will be black holes, there are lots of complicated things in the universe, not at all smooth. And as the universe collapses, gets smaller and smaller, these irregularities get greater and greater and greater, and instead of having this nice you know, smooth universe in the remote future, we get a highly messy irregular thing. And you can put the inflaton field in as you like, it makes no difference whatsoever. It has no effect on this basically congealing singularities of black holes, and they make one incredible mess. Now this is all consistent with what we call the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics increases with time, the, the, the entropy in the universe increases with time. The entropy is a measure of disorder, if you like. It's the measure of the, the disorder in the universe, and as the universe evolves, this disorder increases. And this is a very fundamental law of physics called the second law of thermodynamics. Now it's really a very puzzling law. It's quite makes a lot of sense as you go into the future because things get more random and the, it's not surprising if you like that things get worse. Um, and the fact that you get this great mess when you have a collapsing universe is indeed a feature of the second law of thermodynamics. But what about the very early universe? Now I puzzled about this second law thing for a long time and puzzled also about why the Big Bang isn't like that mess that we see at the end. So if we return to our original picture of the universe with its very smooth initial state, why does the smooth initial state correspond to a low entropy? Well I have to explain this I think with a picture which I have here, and let me indicate this picture with a pointer. I want to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. Here we have three pictures indicating, think of the top part, three pictures indicating a gas in a box. And imagine you've got some partition here and the gas is all collected together in that little part and then you release it. Then it spreads out through the box. And this is consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. The entropy is increasing with the increasing uniformity. And this is a, a natural feature in physics that you see the increasing uniformity corresponds, you say you have this, this uh, um, heat death of the universe, people sometimes say, and that's this very uniform uh, high entropy state. But with gravity it's different, and this is because gravity is uniformly attractive, and it's really, now we imagine, not a gas in a box, but a very very large galactic scale box with a lot of stars in it running around randomly. Now these stars, because of their gravitational effect, will start to clump and form cl clusters of galaxies and so on, and then they will form black holes. And you see that this now looks very much like the opposite of this, that the uniformity represents low entropy, and as the entropy increases you get more and more clumping, and when you get black holes the entropy just shoots up enormously. So this is a feature 
of the universe, which we seem to see. It starts off very uniform, and that is low entropy. It's not a random choice. It's a very special choice. And we can see how special it is. In fact, you can work out how special it is. What's the probability that the universe was as special as it was, if it was just chosen randomly? And because of the formula due to Stephen Hawking for the entropy in black holes, we now have a measure of what the entropy would be if everything collapsed into a black hole, or even fall short of that quite reasonably. And thinking of that as the possible entropy of the universe and tells you what the possibilities were, how unlikely was the initial state of the universe? Well, the answer is something like 10 to the power, that is 10 with a exponent, that power is 10 to the power of 124. I think it's 124 if I remember my figures correctly. And this is the entropy you get because of the black holes. It's absolutely incredible. So the unlikeliness of this initial state is unbelievable. If it was something like random, it has to have come about through some extraordinary feature. And its inflation is certainly not nearly enough to do that. I don't think it gets anywhere close. So now what I want to do is to talk about these two ends of the universe. The remote future, first of all, and then the Big Bang and see if we can gain some insights by looking at it. And by looking at them, I want to use a trick, which is a trick of conformal geometry. And we can see this in this Escher picture. We see in the Escher picture, this is not, I think, the angels and devils, it's another Escher, Escher picture, where you see the hyperbolic geometry. As I say, it's, it's like Euclidean geometry, but a little bit different. And you see infinity is now represented by this circular boundary. And you see that the fish, whatever they are, get look as though they're getting smaller and smaller. But as far as they're concerned, they're just the same as the ones in the middle. Now, what conformal means is that shapes, small shapes, are accurate, accurately re represented, even though the sizes may not be. So you see it squashed more and more at the edge. You see this most clearly with the eyes of the fish. They're circles. And these circles remain circles no matter how close you get to the boundary. Yet, they get, seem to us to get smaller and smaller, but to the fish, they're just the same size right to the edge. Now, this is what's called a conformal representation. It's a very useful representation in relativity. In terms of the geometry of the fish, it's a, the conformal nature is that angles are preserved. So the angles are correctly represented, but the sizes are not. Or it's like small shapes are correctly represented, but the, whether it's big or small, you can play with that. You can make them look smaller, even though they may think they're the same size. Now, I want to use this trick now to talk about the remote future. Now, the remote future, if we have this exponential expansion, which we seem to see, which comes about from Einstein's lambda term, um, which he retracted by mistake, uh, we take that lambda term and you see this continual exponential expanding universe. As in my picture, I've only got gone a little way in the picture, but it keeps on going like that. And with that, you can actually squash that infinity down to a sort of moment. So you have a moment in time, which is time infinity, if you like, but by the Escher trick, or the trick due to Beltrami, who was an Italian mathematician who actually designed that particular trick that Escher is using, uh, that you see this boundary squashed down and now it's a surface in the picture, of course, it's just a curve, That's but three-dimensional surface, which would be the boundary at time infinity. And it's just like anywhere else. And I want to try and explain what I mean by it being just like anywhere else. And the most important structure that we have in space-time is a thing called the light cone. Now, in my next picture, I have a, a, a picture of the light cone, or it's exactly a, a null cone, if you like. It's what, what you happen locally at a point. And it tells you what the speed of light is, if you like. So the, the boundary of this cone represents a, a flash of light. You see the, the vertex of the cone is the flash of light, and it spreads out over the cone, and uh, it represents the history of that flight, light flash. And in the right-hand side of that picture, I have a sort of box showing you with the full number of dimensions. This is the sphere 
of the light flash expanding outwards. And then in the picture on the left, you see there's a section through that cone as you go upwards. And lower down in the picture, you will see that in the flat space of special relativity, that's when there's no gravity. This is due to Minkowski, Minkowski and geometry, which uh, Einstein picked up on. He didn't like the idea of space-time initially, but Minkowski, I think, persuaded him it was a good thing to do eventually. And uh, it was very important that he did this because then he could develop his theory to the curved space of general relativity, which you see in the bottom part of this picture. Now, I want to talk about the light cones a little bit more. So let me do that by going to my whiteboard. And first of all, let me just show the light cone. And here we have... Mm -hmm. Here we have the flash of light going out as time progresses upwards. And we also imagine a past cone, which is a flash of light, imaginary flash of light coming in and converging on that point. There doesn't have to be any light there. It just represents the speed of light in both directions. So this also means that if you have a massive particle, that travels with less than the speed of light. And here I have two examples of a massive particle. And there you see the red one and the blue one. They're going at very different speeds with respect to each other, not quite the speed of light. They'd be tilted up with the cone if it's the speed of light, and they can't do that. Massive things can only go lower than the speed of light, and you can see two different uh, observers, if you like, traveling at different speeds. Now, this light cone does not quite carry the whole of the space-time geometry. At each point in general relativity, you have a thing called the metric, which has 10 components, 10 numbers to characterize it. And basically nine of these are telling you where the light cone is. When I say nine, it's really the ratios of those 10. And that is, gives you, the nine, those nine numbers tell you where the light cone is. So it's most of the geometry. It's not quite the whole geometry. The only other part of the geometry is the measure of time that particles have. So each one of these space-like sorry, time-like lines here, each one of these histories of space of massless, of massive particles, there will be a clock, imagine a clock there ticking away, and the clock will tick at rates which, if you like, are a little different from each other. And to explain that rate, I'll, I need another picture. And for this other picture, first of all, let me take this away, which is the famous formula to Einstein, except I have it the wrong way around. Sorry about that. Doesn't make any difference to my picture. Here we have Einstein's famous E equals MC squared. And here we have Max Planck's older formula not quite so famous, but just as important for physics, the basics of, basis of quantum mechanics, E equals H nu. What Einstein's formula says that energy and mass are equivalent. C squared is just a constant, speed of light squared. And Max Planck's formula, E equals H nu. Nu is a frequency. Sometimes people call it HF. F is a frequency. And H is Planck's constant. So you have constants in each case, but apart from the constant, Einstein tells you that energy and mass are equivalent. Planck tells us energy and frequency are equivalent. Put the two together, that tells us mass and frequency are equivalent. So if you have a massive particle, it is a clock with a very, very, very precisely determined frequency. It's a very high frequency, so you can't use that very well as a clock, but you can sort of uh, scale it down to something you can me actually measure. And modern atomic and nuclear clocks are based on this fact, the fact that mass is basically a clock. And this is a wonderful thing because it tells you as long as you have mass around, you actually have the full metric. You know what sizes are, you know what big and small are, and that's what gives you the metric of space-time. And I have here another picture which tells you how they different. You see, here we have these sort of 
mountain, hill shaped surfaces and bowl shaped surfaces there. Each of those represent the same time for these different clocks. So as this clock goes around, its first tick is the first bowl shaped surface that hits, the next one is the next one. That's, that's one second, two seconds, three seconds, one second, two seconds, three seconds. So you see how the, the time is included in the picture. If I have those two together, let's remove the one in the middle. That is the whole metric with the light cone and the scaling. That's the, how crowded those surfaces are. This by itself is the conformal structure. Now, if you have mass, then you have both. You have the conformal structure as well as the scaling. But if you don't have mass, you only have the light cones. Now, this is very important for me because what do we have in the very remote future? Well, we have black holes. These black holes will eventually disappear through Hawking evaporation. I'll come to that later. You have a little bit of mass. You have some hydrogen. This gets thinned out. But basically, you have the dominant feature of the universe in the remote future would be photons. And photons have no mass. And these photons shoot along the light cone. Think of the orange one as a photon. Zips along. It doesn't even encounter the first of these bow shaped surfaces. It just it doesn't hit it at all. So the light cone is where the light ray lives, and the photon doesn't experience any passage of time at all. So right up to infinity, it's zero time for a photon. Some people say, say it the wrong way around. They say it free, the, the, life, the world freezes or something. That's backwards. It's not. No, the whole thing zips through in no time at all. For the photon, the whole of infinity is encompassed in no time at all. So it gets to infinity. So if you like this Escher picture where you have this boundary, if you think now in space-time terms, which I'm going to do in a minute, let's look at our next picture. The next picture will represent the squashing down of infinity. I'm also doing another trick in this picture too, but let's come to the infinity part first. The squashing down of infinity to a finite-looking boundary. And as far as the light rows are concerned, they simply get there. They might wonder what happens. This is the end of the universe as far as the photons are concerned. But they reach that boundary. And it makes mathematical sense to call that a nice smooth <laughs> boundary. Now, what about the other end? Now, you see, the other end could have been this great mess, which I mentioned to you before, but it wasn't. And we have, that's one of the great mysteries. And I always regarded this as not just the elephant in the room, it's the diplodocus in the room. It's absolutely enormous things staring you in the face. Why is the universe so extraordinarily special? And inflation doesn't do it for you. None of these things do. You can get a little way towards it if you like, but it's a huge puzzle. Why was the universe, the universe so uniform in this very particular way? And it's uniform in a way which if you stretch it out now, I'm doing the opposite trick to the, to the uh, remote future, I'm stretching the Big Bang. And if you can stretch the Big Bang out to make it smooth, that would be a very, very strong condition. Now, I used to phrase this in different ways. I used to call it what's called the vial curvature hypothesis. There's a thing called the vial curvature, which is the conformal curvature, and the conformal curvature goes to zero. And that was what I like to say. But it was a bit awkward to handle. And one of my students, this is a very good student I had called Paul Todd, and he had a better way of saying it. He says, why don't you just say that this conformal trick works for the Big Bang too? that you can stretch out the Big Bang and make it nice and smooth. So in this picture, I've done two tricks. I've squashed the infinity down. That works in a very, very wide class of models. Uh, uh, a very good German relativist called Helmut Friedrich has a general theorem which tells you that it's very, very general. You might have black holes in the way you get rid of them. But apart from things like that, you do get a nice, smooth boundary in very general circumstances, provided you have this positive cosmological constant, the lambda term. As for the Big Bang, it's a completely opposite story. That is an extremely special case, very, very special case. And the argument that Paul was making is that let's characterize it this way. 
That's nearly good enough for me, not quite good enough, because it doesn't make the vial curvature zero, it just makes it finite. And I had an idea at one point, I think the idea came about because I was worrying about how boring the universe was. I don't mean it's boring now, but in the very, very, very remote future, well, it's not so boring when there are black holes around, but when they've evaporated away, that's really boring. And I just left in infinite term uh, uh, tedium, that was that the fate for us. And it didn't seem to me that was a very nice future for the universe. But then I began to think, suppose you didn't have any mass at that time. I don't mean you or me, I mean light. <laughs> it doesn't have any mass. Or even if the, the matter that is lying around, there's hydrogen and various particles running around, if they gradually do lose their mass, which is a hypothesis which I want to make, if there is a very slow fade out of mass as well, which is not inconsistent with physics when you put this lambda cosmological con constant term. It changes particle physics a bit and then mass becomes not such a constant thing as it is in the normal way that particle physicists look at physics. So maybe the mass can fade out too. So in the remote future the conformal picture is not such a bad picture because it is the picture of massless things. What about the Big Bang though? It's completely opposite. It's very hot. It's, the closer you get to the Big Bang, the hotter it gets. But it gets so hot that the mass of particles becomes completely irrelevant. The energy, e equals mc squared again, the energy that the particles have due to their motion completely swamps the mass, and so particles are again effectively massless. At the two ends, then, the universe really does respect the conformal geometry. So that's the point of view I'm taking. And now I'm doing something outrageous. Everything I said up to this point is reason you could justify what I say. I hope you can justify what I'm going to say in a minute, but it's still outrageous. I'm saying that our universe, as we currently think of it, without an inflation, I have to say, inflation present would wreck the mole. It would wreck uh, Paul Todd's picture. <laughs> it would wreck this model. It would make the, uh, the, uh, the Big Bang much too far away in a certain sense, which I don't want to do. So let's, ha let's not have inflation. And now the picture I have, this is our universe. I'm going to change the terminology now. What we used to call our universe is our current eon, A-E-O-N. I'm calling this Big Bang right up to this exponential expansion squashed down infinitely, uh, infinitely squashed. And that our Big Bang was the continuation of the remote future of a previous eon. So you squash down this previous eon's remote future, stretch out our Big Bang, and you can do that now because there's no mass around at both ends, and the physics can nice and smoothly continues from one to the next. Now this is outrageous, and I think a lot of people have a lot of trouble in accepting that, but if you think about it, it's not so outrageous, because the physics going on is quite reasonable to think that it could be respecting a conformal picture at that stage. And what's so nice about it is that you automatically get this very, very smooth initial state. You don't have to go to this 10 to the 10 to the 124. You can say the universe really is smooth and forced into this very smooth state by it being the continuation of the remote future of a previous eon. What's more, and you see this remote exponential expansion of the previous eon. Now that plays the role of what we have inflation for. You see, we think of inflation as occurring in the first well, 10 to the minus 24 seconds or something, whenever I forget the figure now, of the initial universe, some ridiculously small stage of the early universe. No, in this picture, it was the remote future of the previous eon. It just looks as a past the Big Bang because we couldn't think of anything before the Big Bang. But having it before the Big Bang solves all sorts of problems. This is my claim. I'm not going to go into most of those problems. Most of them I don't even know myself. But what I do want to do is to discuss the implications of this. For a long time I thought this was a nice thing to say and I gave lectures about this saying, well nobody's ever going to show it's wrong so I can talk about it endlessly. And then I thought of an idea about how you might test it. And in my next picture, I think I show this, where what happens to black holes, you see? Black holes will swallow, we have in our, we have a couple of smaller ones, but we have in our galaxy a black hole which was about 
um, four million times the mass of the sun. It's a pretty big thing. I may say it's fairly small compared with a lot of other black holes which are now evidenced, but we have this huge black hole in the center. You can see the stars, even with the time that we've seen to observe stars going around, you can see them actually going around this central object. And now we have pictures. <laughs> I'm not sure about our one, but other black holes. And you can actually see them, and they're there. Our black hole, as I say, is about, um, uh, what should I say, 10 million times the, uh, uh, 4 million times the mass, the mass of the sun. Anyway, it's a relatively small black hole. We are on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. Our galaxy is a cluster of not very many, a few cluster, few galaxies in it. Uh, there are not very many big ones, we're quite a big one. The Andromeda galaxy is even bigger than ours, and they have a much bigger black hole in their cen center, which is, I forget how much bigger than ours, but considerably larger than ours. And when it's going to collide with this, not for a while, so don't worry about it. Lots of dreadful things are happening to us before that. But in uh, eventually this Andromeda galaxy will collide with us and our black holes, we might not collide with each other, we'll go through each, galaxies probably go through each other with, without the black holes hitting, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but then they'll settle down and congeal into one bigger galactic galaxy and this galaxy, the black holes, will feel each other out, eventually spiral into each other and as they whack into each other, there will be one walloping great radiation, gravitational radiation coming out. None of the signals we've seen yet, it's not impossible that we could see that with a distant, very, very distant galaxy colliding each other, but that hasn't been yet, seen yet in our galaxy, but maybe we'll see them in the previous eon. You see, these explosions between supermassive black holes will be so violent that these gravitational waves, nothing will stop them, the waves go right through until they hit the crossover between one eon and the next. And they will produce a disturbance in the initial dark matter, there's dark matter produced in the, in the universe, and this dark matter will be kicked slightly by this gravitational radiation, and this will cause a disturbance in the microwave background, which will look like a slight reddening of a little a ring in the sky, this ring will be slightly warmer or slightly cooler, it'll be warmer slightly if it's a relatively, I have to get it the right way around, it's, it's actually if it's moving away from us, it's quite curious, if it's a very distant collision, then because of the way the geometry works, the signal comes towards us. If it's a relatively near collision, then the signal is going away and it's it's the opposite way around, so it's slightly red-shifted. It's all very confusing. For the, the close ones are actually the warmer ones, and the more distant ones are the uh, closer ones are the slightly cooler ones, and the, and the ones which are more distant are the warmer ones, which is slightly strange, but still, that's the way it works out. Anyway, so I asked uh, Vahe, Gurzajan, who was a colleague I'd known, he's an Armenian, I'd known him for quite a long time, to see whether you might possibly see these things. Actually, I'd ask somebody else, I'd ask, uh, um, oh dear, I forget the name, I hope you can cut this bit out. <laughs> no problem. Um, his name has just gone and blocked out of my head, I'm sorry. No problem. No problem. Yes, yes. Okay. I had asked some other people earlier, but, but so they didn't get, they didn't find any signals. I, I can understand why they didn't, because they were looking for the signal in a way which couldn't make use of the feature that Vahe did. The feature I make, you can make use of is that you don't just know, look for one such ring, you look for concentric rings. Because what you would expect is that these black hole collisions in a cluster of galaxies they will have, happen many times, because in a reasonable sized cluster, they will, you know, one will, two pairs will collide, and another one will collide, and another one in the same cluster, and then these will collide, and those will be more or less in the same place in the point in the sky. In the cosmic microwave background, you will get the central center, which will be the, where the 
galactic cluster ended up and then the rings will come from that and if you have several collisions within the same cluster they will pretty be pretty well concentric so I asked Vahe to look for concentric rings and he did look for concentric rings and he found quite a lot and I can show you some pictures of that let's talk about the 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 uh, that picture, uh, the, the nice picture, the big picture with the reds and blue dots and things. Yes. I don't know what that is, yes. Okay, shall I start? <clears throat> yes, where are Here we have a picture made by, by my colleague Vahe Gosajan. And can you see, you can see points in the picture which represent centers of triple low variance circles. He, picks out the rings not from the temperature being warmer or cooler but by the fact that the temperature is more uniform around the ring which is a very good criterion as it turns out for a region which I'll come to but um, the ones which are red points are red in the color coding which means warm which means <laughs> lower frequency or lower energy, which means in the cosmology we think of the most distant, but here they are closer. So the red one in the lower right hand region, or the sort of middle lower right hand, this red patch is relatively close. When I say relatively close, it is seeable with, with telescopes, or with radio telescopes if you like or something. You can actually, uh, within the range of what we could see. The blue one at the top is much more distant and then there's a sort of greenish one on the left hand side now what's interesting about this is not just that these centers seem to be there but they're very non-uniform you see it shows that the universe is much clumpier than people think on this extremely large scale it's interesting too because uh, a canadian group headed by I'm getting my names problem, I'm sorry. Douglas Scott. A Canadian, a Canadian group headed by Douglas Scott uh, repeated by his analysis and found almost exactly the same pictures. They did it first with the W map, which was the original one that that uh, Vahe found. The book picture I just showed you is, is his one with the, with the Planck data, which is more precise detailed data. Uh, but they found exactly the same pictures, even though they were very skeptical about the whole thing, trying to explain it in some other way. But nevertheless, those inhomogeneities are there, and they're extremely striking. And what's more striking, in a way, is that they're in distance as well as angular distribution. So we see them clumped, but the ones we see as red are relatively close, and all red, you see. And the ones we see as blue are relatively far away, and they're clumped together, also temporally, if you like, or in, in, in distance, and the greenish one in the, in the middle on the left-hand side is also a sort of intermediate scale of size. So this is a, a good uh, indication that there is something going on that people don't get from normal analyses of, of uh, cosmology. Now I want to tell you about something else. More recently, or I should say first that the, a Polish group also independently uh, analyzed, not the same way as Vahe had done it, they did it a completely different way, but they also found very convincing signals of the presence of these rings. And they had a confidence level of 99.4% that these are a real effect, not a random effect. And then later on, we got to, I got together with a Polish group and headed by Christoph Meisner, uh, and we then looked for a different signal. You see, I hadn't had the courage to look at another signal because I know what happens with black holes, and I mentioned this earlier, is that they eventually evaporate away. It takes them an awful long to do it, time to do it. It takes something like 10 to the power 109 years. So this is quite a long time. <laughs> 109 zeros basically. Yeah. That's right. That number of years, this is for the biggest black holes there, the smaller ones will go, go a lot earlier than that. <laughs> Not very soon, but a lot earlier than that. The biggest ones, the whopping great supermassive black holes, will take that sort of time before they finally evaporate away by Hawking evaporation. This is a very, very tiny temperature that these black holes have through delicate quantum field theory effects 
And the bigger they are, the colder they are, and the longer it will take for them to decay away. And they eventually disappear with a pop. I call it a pop because although maybe you call it a nuclear explosion or something, it's very, very small on cosmological scale. Now, pop into radiation. That's the end of them. And, but nevertheless, on the conformal picture, since it takes them so long, remember the Escher picture with them all all the little fish squashed up at the edge, all this radiation is squashed up in this little tiny point. Even though it takes that long to, to get away from the black hole, it's still just one little point. So it all comes through in that point. All the energy in that supermassive black hole, which has probably swallowed an entire cluster of galaxies before finally disappearing with a pop, it comes through into our eon. That's an awful lot of mass coming through. So you ought to see something. It's, it's the one discrepancy in the smoothness. You see, everywhere the transition from one eon to the next is very, very smooth, and you can describe it with nice smooth equations. But these hawking points, as I call them, are these little windows, if you like, from, from into the previous eon, which is a little hole into the previous eon. But we don't see the hole. What we see is this energy pouring through that little spot. And what does it do? Well, it's like a point in the conformally stretched Big Bang. It takes about 380,000 years before these photons come out, before they can get free. What they, 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 they just can't get, they scatter against them, they, all the matter that's produced and everything which created, and they just jump around and they can't get out. It's just a great mess. And finally, they are escape at what's called the last scattering surface or decoupling. They're not quite the same place, but more or less the same place. You have this decoupling surface where they finally get released into uh, where we are, and so we can see it. 380,000 years. Now that point spreads out to about four degrees in the sky. So four degrees is about eight times the full moon's diameter. So you take the full moon, imagine something eight times bigger than that, that is the size of the spread of this point. It'll be warmer in the middle, it's a bit like a sort of hump like that, a Gaussian curve, which is peaked in the middle and then spreads out. So hotter in the middle, spread it out to the outside. It's about 15 times, I'm not sure what the figure is, the average temperature variation. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a good deal more than the normal temperature variations, but not something that anybody noticed before. I suppose they never noticed it because they never looked. These spots sitting out there, um, considerably warmer than the average temperature variations, and they're just there. And uh, my colleague, uh, my colleague Christoph Meisner, uh, Daniel Ann, did the analysis of the Horton points. Uh, he's a Korean who now works in New York, and another Polish Astrophys a cosmologist. This is Pavel Mirovsky, and th those three and I wrote a paper which is published recently in the uh, monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And the confidence level that we give for this, for this is about 99.98 percent confidence. If you compare with the sort of random skies that you make and see how many of them give figures like this, you have to see about one, about two in, in uh, 10,000 of these uh, maps, you occasionally see it, but nothing with the strongest, uh, as strong a signal. And we see them both in the W map and in the Planck data. It's not so clear where these Hawking points are because the analysis only tells you they're there. Uh, Daniel Land did a, another analysis actually to look for the points, and he found quite a lot of candidates. Now, I'm only going to trust the ones which you see the five strongest ones in the Planck data are all in the same place in the WMAP data. So I think that's pretty clear for those strongest ones. I'm not sure whether to trust the weaker ones. There is one more which is not quite so strong in the Planck data, but I think it's very strong in the WMAP data. And so I'm trusting that too, because if you see them in both Planck and WMAP, I'm going to so say those are genuine Hawking points. Now, why is it good to see these Hawking points? Probably for lots of reasons. Maybe they have really important cosmological implications because they 
Nobody really studied these things before. I think it's something that should be studied. But the thing that I did wonder about is whether you could see those talking points in the analysis of the collisions between the black holes. Because those talking points would have come, if that's what they are, would have come from the black hole swallowing an entire galactic cluster. In the process, it would have swallowed other supermassive black holes. And so you would expect, at least sometimes, we don't know how many, how strong they would be, a few cases where they would have swallowed, say, at least three other supermassive black holes. And if they swallowed at least three, Vahe might see them in his analysis. There's also another reason he might see them, is because these signals are rather nastily placed from the observational point of view, because we just see them just as our past cone hits the stretched out Big Bang, and that means that the black hole's world line, after it is evaporated away, hits just there. And this means that the explosions from the collisions we see edge on. And if we see them edge on, they're neither warmer nor cooler. But they will have low va variance in the variation in the temperature. And therefore, you might well see them as green rings in Vahe's analysis. So I asked Va Vahe, look at these points. Do you see triples of green rings exactly on the Hawking points? When I say exactly, it could be a little bit of variation. And so he looked, and he said, no guarantee that you'll see them. He looked at these six points, and three of them have, I'll show you the pictures. Where is my picture? <laughs> I hope you can cut this. <laughs> Here we have the picture. Can you see it there? Yes. The top, we see uh, the cosmic microwave background of the whole sky, the red region here, that's relatively close, the blue region relatively distant, and the sort of greenish one in the, in the middle. And this is a long way off, so you wouldn't see hawking points in the middle of that. This is, this is sorry, too close, you wouldn't see them there. You wouldn't see them here, that's too far. But you might see some odd ones which are green in this picture. Now the question is, if you look at the points, and you, I've got them marked as B, one, two, three, I can't quite see them where I am, but perhaps you can see if I get this close enough. Can you see them there? They're Bs. Yes. Yes. B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, B and 6. B6. B6, I think, is the one you saw in the, plan, in the W map. In. Yes. And here at the bottom, I've got them all. You see close-ups of all those pictures. Can you see them all? Yes. Now, I think it's the, these ones. Is it this one, this one, and that one? I think if I'm pointing right. This one, this one, and that one. You will see these three. I don't think they have any noticeable green point in them. But there you see right in the middle, very close to the Hawking point. The Hawking point is the black point in the center. You will see that there is a green spot. Now, that's pretty unlikely because as a whole, there, the sky isn't very densely covered with these green regions. So it's probably, uh, even to see one is a bit unlikely, but to see three, it's a pretty significant, I would say about 99% confidence, something like that. Anyway, I'm showing you this. This is new information. It's not been published. It's not been advertised anywhere before this. I asked Vahe, is it all right for me to show his pictures? He says, yes, go ahead. So I'm showing them here to you now. Um, this is a new observation which ties up the signals from the what we claim to be are the signals from the colliding black holes and the Hawking points. So the Hawking points, as I say, are the remote future of a black hole which has swallowed an entire cluster of galaxies and in the process has uh, swallowed at least three of those other supermassive black holes in those particular three cases. They could have swallowed two in these cases or maybe some small ones that you don't see. But uh, Anyway, so that's the new information. This, I find is, it this is absolutely amazing. In effect, what you're saying here is that you're verifying the information from the ripples uh, of the past 
then you have information from the Hawking hotspots. You can correlate them between them. Yes. And therefore, we're not speaking about gravitational waves of this eon, but gravitation, or no, not even gravitational waves. We're looking at uh, a window from before the Big Bang, and we are yes. actually seeing and having evidence that indeed there has been eons before the Big Bang, and the Big Bang isn't the beginning, but it's a repetition of lots of Big Bangs, a sequence of Big Bangs. And you have very strong evidence here, which uh, comes to strengthen this uh, cyclic conformity uh, theory that uh, we are living in a universe that keeps big banging again and again. That's right. That's the idea. Yeah, absolutely. I find it hard to convince people, but that's because people are so wedded to the conventional model, um, which is fine. I mean, I'm agreeing with the conventional model completely apart from inflation. So the inflationary phase I always thought was pretty fishy because it, it, it's so hard to make a, <clears throat> a field do that right in the early, early stages. And uh, I didn't like it for the other reason, which it didn't solve the uniformity problem. The second law of thermodynamics, you need something much more serious. And that I should, the problem there is solved in CCC because the black holes are where the entropy goes and they get swallowed up and they disappear into the Hawking points. So all that information that was, if you like, swallowed by the black holes is tucked into the Hawking points and it's pretty well lost there. And what we see uh, is a, a new universe um, which created from the, uh, from the remote future of the previous eon. This is mind-boggling information and uh, I can't express enough my enthusiasm in hearing this brand new information. Um, and also, the topic of this uh, webinar, we called it, Are the Black Holes a Window to a Time, Quotes Time, Before the Big <laughs> Bang? And that's exactly what you're saying right now. And exactly. I, I'm, I'm speechless with what I've just heard. There are actually two. Well, one is this real window that is a little point you're looking through into the other. The other is the ripples, which, well, it's, they're both interesting and they're both telling us different things. And the, it's interesting that you can tie them together, but only with the, the green rings. The other ones, uh, they're not hawking points because they, they cross over as, as a different place where they don't. They might have evidence, though. You see, it's possible that the Hawking points, which you don't directly see, cause um, clumping of material, which uh, has an effect in other ways. I haven't thought about that very much, but it's, it is possible that it will affect the evolution of the early universe in ways that are interesting, other than just seeing the Hawking points directly. That would be very fascinating for somebody to work out. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Sir Roger Penrose today explained to us in a very precise manner with a lot of evidence that the Big Bang is not the beginning of our universe, but merely one of many, many Big Bangs that happened in the past. And we have evidence, evidence that is correlated. And uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. I can actually see your questions flying through. So we're going to start asking one by one some of the most relevant questions to Sir Roger Penrose. Thank so you. So let me see what those questions are. So let's go into the questions. The first question that I have here is, do eons coexist at the same time? And if so, could we be able to detect signals from the next eon after us? Well, the answer is, in, in this picture, the eons are sequential. You don't have them parallel. I mean, there's no another one going on at the same time as us. So there is no question in this picture. I mean, they could, could be wrong. Maybe there's another model in which you have sequ e eons which are not simply sequential, but uh, sort of current ones. But in this picture, no. The eons follow each other, one after the other. And you would not expect to get signals from the one after us. That would give us causal problems, which I certainly would not like to accept as a serious piece of physics. So the answer is no, not in this model. 
So in effect, what we are saying here is that we know that there were eons before us. We have uh, evidence and or uh, ripples coming from those eons, but they're not parallel to us, they're before us. So whatever comes That's ahead of us in... So, yes, they might see us. Can't see them. Yes. Um, um, there's a question here which I really like. Um, you name these hotspots um, uh, Hawking Points. Why are they called Hawking Points and who chose this name? Well, that was my fault. <laughs> I chose the name myself in honor of Stephen Hawking because the hooking points in this picture are more or less consist of the radiation coming from the black holes. So the black holes, according to Stephen Hawking, and it's a, a, a wonderful uh, result that he presented, theoretical result, which I'm very happy with, is that in a very long period of time, the black holes will evaporate away. And for the really big ones, it takes something like 10 to the 109 years. So you one with 109, 106 years, I think it is, one with 106 zeros following it. That number of years, that it takes that long for the black hole to evaporate away. This is the longest lived ones, to evaporate away completely into radiation. And it's that radiation which is compressed into the point which comes across. So it is the Hawking radiation, I think it's a very apt name to call them Hawking points. Whether Stephen Hawking would have liked them himself, I'm not so sure, <laughs> because he had a different to describe this to him. I didn't get much of a reaction from him, so I had no idea what he thought about it. And I have to say at this point that uh, watching the the movie of uh, the um, it's called the String Theory, if I remember well. Um, uh, in that movie, it actually shows um, uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, being um, fascinated by all your theories and that actually led him into creating his own uh, uh, set of uh, theories and that actually is a, a strong connection why um, these uh, names uh, uh, go back to <laughs> honor his name. Um, so I've got more questions here. Um, why in the map of the hotspots we see a band of nothing, no information, right in the middle of the image. I should have said this. This is a pure artifact of the analysis because that's the galactic plane. You see, our galaxy lies in the middle of that strip and people think, oh, well, maybe signals that you see there are not to be trusted. And so the tendency is to remove that from the, from the picture. So although there could well be um, many, many, many hawking, I don't know, hawking points or signals of uh, rings from colliding black holes, but we just don't mark them there because the galaxy is in the way. And so people, well, Vahe in particular in his analysis, decided to remove that region so that we would not get confused by the presence of our galaxy. It's an artifact of the, of the analysis. Yes. There so could be many such points in there, actually, yes. you see. So, so we're basically, for, for, for safety of the data, uh, we are not including that region. Um, so to the next uh, question, um, if the black holes are remainders from a previous epoch, does that mean we'll find out what exactly existed before the Big Bang? Well, indeed, that's the idea, <laughs> that we have signals of these two kinds and maybe others because we could put magnetic fields coming through from the previous eon. This is a very strong possibility, which we have not studied very much. But the two particular features that are discussed here are the gravitational waves coming from black holes spiraling around each other and swallowing each other up, and they produce this huge, enormous energy release in these gravitational signals. We don't see them directly in ours, but you'd be very lucky to see one of these collisions. Maybe we will someday. But the one from the previous eon, I mean, this is the picture. If somebody else has another explanation, I would be very pleased to hear about it. 
but we do see the Hawking points, and that is the remnant of the black hole itself. And when I say the remnant, I mean it's the compression of all the radiation that comes out from the black hole, and this is the Hawking radiation, which is why they're called Hawking points. And this is concentrated in a single point on the crossover, and this then spreads out to eight times the diameter of the moon in these uh, re regions that we actually see. And, and another example on the sky, just for the purpose of our audience, uh, that stretches across the, the sky uh, the sky in uh, many times the diameter of the moon would be the Andromeda galaxy itself. But it's not bright enough to be able to see it, and we barely see its core with the naked eye in a very, very clear dark sky. So these points, they're not a, a few times bigger than the moon, they're ginormous points. It's simply that on our sky, from our perspective, that's how big we see them in comparison to our moon, which is fantastically closer than those that are at the far ends of the universe. Um, exactly. So um, there are many more questions here. Um, that's what, a question that I would like to ask, and that's a question coming from myself. Um, we are, uh, as I said before, we're delighted that you have made such an announcement today, which comes to further verify the theory that um, the, the Big Bang isn't the beginning of everything but it's just a continuation of many previous Big Bangs. And the specific aspect of what you explain is the green of those green dots. I should explain this. Actually, I, I realize on reflection, I said it the wrong way around. The red region on the bottom right is actually closer it always confuses me because there are two confusions. One is that red actually means cool and blue means red is actually color coded as warmer because we think of you know red heat and all that. And in fact, that's the cooler one. And so these are the cooler ones, but the signal for the red ones is going away from it. So it's never mind about the details. The red ones should be actually the closer ones, and it's the blue ones at the upper right which are very distant. So I, I said it on the spot, I'm afraid, the wrong way around. So please correct that. But the point I want to make is that the green ones are the ones that are just on the edge between coming towards us and going away from us. So, I mean, the signals coming towards us are going away from us. And the signals coming towards us would be the distant blue, blue coded ones. Now I always might get myself confused here. <laughs> the, and the signals going away from us are the, the red ones. Never mind, I did it wrong. But it's, it's the, the red region at the lower right is the very distant region, and the blue one at the upper right is the, is the relatively close region. That's the right way around. I should have said it that way around before. But the ones just on the edge are the ones where our past light cone hits the crossover. So when you trace back the light that comes to our eye, if you like, right back to the to the crossover between one eon and the next, that is where we see the Hawking point. You see, we see the black hole in the previous eon coming here, and if our light cone just hits that point, it's intermediate between the light cone being this side of it or that side of it. And you just, when you just catch it, that's the intermediate temperature. And the intermediate temperature is the green spots. So the green spots are the ones which are, are not, too, not warmer than average and not cooler than average, but they are average. And the only reason we can see them at all is because Vahe's analysis is to look for the low variance. So he doesn't look for the warm ones or the cool ones. He looks for those rings which have low variation in the temperature around the, around the ring. So it's very fortunate that he actually chose that way of analysis. The Polish people did it a different way. So you can't see these rings in the way they did it. But the way that Vahe did it, you actually do pick out the ones which are... Oh, temperature intermediate between the, the warm ones and the cool ones, in other words, the blue ones and the, and the red ones, or the red ones and the blue ones, where we get confused whichever <laughs> way around it is. I wish and, everybody had your clarity at your age. Definitely, I don't expect myself <laughs> to be as uh, 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 clear I as you are. I did, I did say it the wrong way around in the actual talk, so please correct that when you, when you think about it. But the green ones are the ones intermediate between the two, and therefore you just catch them 
as I pass light cone, hits the crossover surface. If they're too soon, you wouldn't see the hooking points. If they're too far out on the other side, then you wouldn't see the hooking points. So there would be lots, there would be lots, lots more of them. And then they may well have effects, which we can see. I mean, it may well be that they produce uh, regions of concentration of material which produce other black holes in our eon or something like that. I don't know. There are questions about black holes which seem to be produced very early, and people are a little puzzled by that, whether that can happen. And whether that's anything to do with, with Hawking points, I don't know. But it's a nice in area for research. All sorts of areas for research, I think, are raised by this. Um, for the purpose of uh, clarity for the audiences, uh, I would say that what we have here is we have the original evidence of the repos. Then we have the other evidence of the hotspots, the Hawking points. And now we're coming with yes. the third evidence, which is the green points, which is now coming to uh, bind all the information, correlate information, and therefore it makes the, uh, the, the certainty level that what we are seeing is coming indeed from previous eons much, much higher than it was ever before. Well, and that's... It's a little bit, I think we need more analysis here. But I think, you know, of the six points which are seen both in Planck and W map, so I wouldn't necessarily trust all of them, but those six I think we can trust, so six of that, we trust. So uh, the fact that they're seen in both maps at exactly the same places I think is pretty strong evidence. And of those, three of them have this signal. Now, you wouldn't necessarily expect all of them. These are indications of collisions, according to the theory, between the supermassive black hole that causes the Hawking point and the fact that that black hole had swallowed three others in its creation. And three other big ones, big enough that you would actually see the signals from them. Maybe when we get more detailed analysis, we would see other rings in the, in the three. We don't yet see green points there. So there may be some other green points. But what's also interesting is you could get a picture of the history of that black hole you'll be able to work out, I haven't done the calculations here, but you'll be able to work out what the mass is, you'll be able to work out the history of it, when did it swallow those other three black holes, exactly at what stage in its history did it do that, and how massive were they? So it's quite interesting, with some detailed analysis, you could work these things out, and I think it's really quite exciting to find a picture of the sort in an eon that we can't even see directly. And the questions? The questions come uh, still come flying in. Uh, we are broadcasting simultaneously on Facebook and on YouTube, so we're collecting all the questions from both sides. Um, there's a question here from somebody who is asking: um, Could we also possibly have intelligent signals reaching us from the other side of the previous eon? Well, that's a very interesting question. In fact, Vahe Gozajan and I did write a paper on that. In fact, it's the very paper in which you see the, the, the nice sort of red and, and blue regions and even the, the green hawking points. It's in that particular picture. And we, but we wrote a paper on what's called the Fermi paradox. I should explain why that is. There is this program called the SETI program for looking for civilizations in distant galaxies. And the question is, did we, are we lucky enough to find some civilizations which evolved much earlier than ours? Maybe they had dinosaurs which were wiped up <laughs> a lot earlier than our ones were. And they were early enough that they developed a civilization that was capable of sending coherent signals across space, and maybe we could pick these up. So it's a very interesting project. I don't think anything has been seen as yet, or no, with, not with any confidence. But you'd be pretty lucky, I think, to see such signals because you'd have to find uh, evidence of civilizations which had advanced that much ahead of us and earlier than us, that, that when the length of time that the signal comes to us uh, before, they'd have to have reach, reached this uh, level of civilization before us. But the thing is, with the previous eon, you are in principle, in principle, uh, capable of seeing civilizations that are way, way advanced ahead of us. They would have to be very much advanced if they were going to send a signal to get through. But theoretically, they could. Because electromagnetic signals, so long as they are of long enough wavelength, they would have to be very long wavelength radio signals of some sort, and probably beamed at us, 
So they might have to be clever enough to realize which regions in the succeeding eon are likely to produce resulting intelligent life or something like that, and maybe beam these signals in those directions. I don't know. I have no, <laughs> no reason to believe or disbelieve this. But it's a very interesting and intriguing question. It's theoretically possible that signals could come through they would be probably electromagnetic signals, which you might imagine other things like neutrino signals or something like that, which could also get through. And uh, maybe they have sent us signals and we have to just to look in the, in the right places and possibly see such signals. I just have no idea about whether they are there or not. It's just worth thinking about. Um, ladies and gentlemen, one of the next uh, webinars we're going to have is with uh, John Rummel. He's working for the SETI Institute, and I already wow. suggested to uh, Roger Penrose if we can have another webinar where we have a panel and we include both Sir Roger and uh, uh, John Rammel from the SETI Institute and see what kind of a conversation we have on that one. That would be fascinating. I, I think would be very looking forward to that. So I will continue with the questions that keep coming in. Um, uh, how eons um, have there been so far? <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? According to the general theory, they keep going forever. But maybe there was a first one. I have, I have no idea. I, I think the simplest hypothesis within the scheme of things is that the eons con continue indefinitely in both directions. So they go on forever in the past, and they will continue forever in the future. This is simply a guess. Uh, the theory doesn't say whether they continue in each direction or not. There is a certain question that is interesting in relation to this, and that is whether the constants of nature are the same in e one eon to the next. There are various numbers which govern uh, all sorts of things in physics, in particular chemistry and nuclear physics and so on, which depend on these numbers having particular values. And some people like the idea, I know John Wheeler was very keen on this sort of idea, not with this particular model, because this came after his, uh, I think after he died, I can't remember. But anyway, there are models in which the universe expands and collapses and expands and collapses. And Wheeler particularly did speculate that these constants might change from one to the eon in his version to the next. Now, I prefer the version in which they don't change for various sort of emotional reasons, I think. Um, and, and there's evidence that they don't change that much because of the signals from the, uh, the, the rings which indicate collisions between supermassive black holes. There is a limit. If the previous eon was sort of like ours, then these supermassive black hole collisions could not occur earlier than roughly the equivalent of now in the previous eon. And the equivalent of now in the previous eon more or less gives you a scale of size for these rings, which is something like, I think, 40 degrees across in the sky. And we see them up to about 30 degrees or so, and not bigger. We don't see them bigger than 40 degrees. So there's a sort of agreement there with our eon, so it suggests that it doesn't change that much. It doesn't say it doesn't change at all, and we would need a lot stronger evidence, one way or the other, to, to have a statement about that. And it seems that the same question is being repeated by many people, and clearly we have barely touched the surface of eon, so to have an understanding of how many eons was before the previous one, that's uh, uh, well and truly beyond our current capabilities, I would say. Um, um, will we have this new info published in one of your fantastic books, says uh, David <laughs> Castrillo? It already was published. <laughs> it already was published. That book cycles of time. It, no, not many people bought it, I think. <laughs> cycles of time. Well, I mean, it's, it's a bit out of date because although I did have in that book, the suggestion that you might see the rings from the collisions. I don't think there was any evidence yet. This book was published, I don't know, 10 years ago. I can't quite remember now. 
uh, cycles of time. So there is a book already. I think I need to have a, a new edition. Clearly, there's a lot, a lot more that needs a new section in the book, completely new section, which would describe the observations of these different kinds, which are certainly not there. But the general scheme of things is in that book. So, although, as I say, people didn't pay too much attention, but it's, it's there. So, I, I'm going to make a comment that I remarked myself that this, in effect, has been in the making for over 10 years, and you have stood up and um, persisted on your theory, and now that theory is coming to have uh, more and more and more evidence, and I, for one, sincerely hope that the evidence becomes such that is verified. Well, <laughs> I hope people swing round. It's certainly not had much, uh, I mean, in, uh, amongst the, the, the sort of people who are the experts in cosmology and so on, ha they haven't paid much attention to this scheme. I think it's very hard to get my, one's mind round the idea that the sort of big and small can be equivalent, you see. One's yeah. so fixed in one's feeling about space-time and physics that you have a definite scale given by the mass of things. And the idea that you can sort of lose this scale at the two ends, right at the Big Bang because of the high temperature, or right at the, the very end because of mainly photons around, or maybe mass is lost in the uh, actual massive particles, and that when the mass is gone, then you do have a conformal picture where the light cones are still there, and the picture that you can have a consistent space-time view in which you don't actually have a scale, even though you still have the light cones. And this is something new to people. I don't think people have really got their minds around that. It's certainly a picture that I've been thinking about before, thinking about CCC, or the model we've been talking about. Uh, it was a useful trick in talking about gravitational radiation, just seeing how the radiation behaves when you get out to infinity. And if you think of an infinity of an actual place, and the electromagnetic waves and the gravitational waves make their mark on that infinity, and you can analyze them by doing calculations, sort of local calculations, which is very helpful, just mathematically. So, so for me, it was not such a, although it took me quite a long time worrying about uh, things like the second law of thermodynamics and how it is that the universe came to be so uniform in the early stages, uh, it, I didn't. <laughs> the idea of the conformal cyclic model until, well, as you say, about 10 years ago or so. It, it, it is indeed a, a very difficult notion to wrap one's head around to understand that um, something which is so compressed and so tiny can be the same as something that has expanded to infinity. But the, what you have said, <clears throat> excuse me, what you have said that we have been discussing in the office is um, the, the very fact that mass is the one that defines the scale of the universe. And in the far, 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 far distant future, and we are merely at the very beginning of our own eon, we're a brand new universe yeah. in effect. So in, in all those hundreds of zeros of uh, years in the future, um, when mass is gone, then there will be no measure of scale Therefore, it's as if um, scale doesn't exist, dimensions don't exist, and therefore, there you go. That's your new beginning where you have another big bang where all is being recreated from not zero, but from the lack of mass, which creates from energy brand new mass. Yes, no, that, that's right. You explained that very well, indeed. That's right. So that, that realization only uh, came to me uh, here in your presentation, and um, I, I hope many more people are getting uh, their heads around this uh, notion that it's actually the mass that is responsible for the dimensions in the universe. And you said something else earlier on that actually did strike me as an amazing concept, that a photon doesn't understand time. As far as this photon is concerned, it exists and is traveling from one end of the universe to the other, and it does that instantaneously because you have relativity, you have all the rest of the factors, so the photon doesn't know time. So these are the different principles that come and um, help us to understand the, the mathematics and the theories behind this. Um, more 
question um, from Athena. Uh, she says, oh, that's, that's just a comment. She says, your drawings are excellent, very col colorful, she says. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I hear that there's a question, and the question is... How many ions have you been so far? Have, oh, no, no, we have asked that question at the very beginning, yes, yes, we have asked that question. So, um, these are the questions that I have so far. Um, any further comments uh, from the team here? Any more questions? No? Okay. So, um, Sir Roger, it has been a yes. fantastic uh, question. He's thinking about it. Let's give him some time. <laughs> okay, would, yes, sir. Would the physics be different between eons? Would the physics, the loss of physics, be different between eon, eon to eon? Well, this is a very interesting question. Um, I like to think that it would not be different, but it's to do with these constants of nature. You see, I mean, it could be completely different, but that would wreck everything. It could be that the constants of nature change, and this was a question I uh, addressed earlier. So my and these numbers, I mean, on a very basic principle, which is kind of unresolved in our theories, are the numbers that we have in physics actually determined by definite rules that you couldn't change them. And one of the biggest numbers is this number of the order of what, 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 40 or 10 to the 60. You get, you get numbers which um, are sort of powers of 10 to the 20. And these have to do with the, uh, well, 10 to the 40 number, for example, is the difference between the, the uh, force between the, if you have a hydrogen atom, then you have an electric force which holds it together. But you also have a gravitational force. And the electric force is about 10 to the 40 times greater than the gravitational force. So you have a number of the order of 10 to the power 40. Now you have 10 to the 20s coming in, and you have 10 to the 60s and 10 to the 120. Uh, there all seem to be powers of uh, roughly, when I say 10 to the 20, I don't mean that exactly, but something of that order. So we seem to have a basic number, and these powers of that number feature very strongly in physics, and in the relation between quantum physics and gravitational physics, you have the, the Planck length, or the Planck time, if you like, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds, and then you have the time at which the cosmological constant comes in, and as far as I remember, that's 10 to the 60 bigger or something like that. And then, so the, all these numbers seem to be fixed in the physics we have now. Now, you could imagine the physics in which those numbers are changed. And we have no reason at the moment to know why the numbers have one value rather than another. So certainly, I don't see why these numbers shouldn't change, why the physics shouldn't change. I rather think the scheme would be wrecked if the physics was completely changed. If the numbers were a bit different, it would still maintain, be maintained. And as I mentioned, the change absolutely drastically to the limit we see on the ring sizes. And that does seem to agree with what we expect in, in how big they would get. Um, if you imagine black hole collisions occurring round about now and not much earlier than that, starting round about now, and so in the next eon, people who are round about now in that eon, they look out at the sky and they see how big do these rings got by then, and the answer is something like 40, de 40 degrees across in the sky, and that's a limit. And we don't see anything bigger than that limit, and we see things fairly close to it. So I think that's an indication that the physics does not change very much from eon to eon, but it's a pretty weak piece of evidence at the moment. Um, I'm going to give a final cue to our moderators. They are selecting which questions they send to me. I only see those questions that have been pre-selected uh, by the moderators. So, uh, to the team, if you don't have any more questions coming on either YouTube and or Facebook, let me know. And uh, at, oh, there's the answer. And the answer is... Okay.
So no more questions, which basically means that we can uh, wrap up at this point. Um, before we go and before I say goodbye to you, uh, Sir Roger, um, if we can have the image of uh, the lineup of uh, what's uh, coming ahead of us. Um, so I assume that it's on the screen at the moment. So um, we have uh, a number of webinars coming ahead of us. We have uh, uh, Jonathan from Imperial College. He's the head of Space Lab of Imperial College. And we have Marcello for Exploration for the European Space Agency. Then we have Karen McBride. Uh, she was uh, working on um, the Mars program of NASA. We have uh, the SETI Institute, uh, John Rammel, who's going to speak to us about intelligent life. And we have uh, uh, Dr. Levadiotis, who is an expert in uh, plasma physics. So we have a, a, a long lineup of uh, presentations. And of course, we started with Sir Roger today, and we look forward to having Sir Roger with us again, with uh, John Rammel and maybe uh, Marcello Gradini. I have to speak to both of them and see if they agree. And if we have an agreement, then that basically means we will have a seventh uh, webinar at the end to wrap up the series. Sir Roger, a big, big thank you uh, for your presentation. Again, it was amazing uh, to see uh, evidence to something that is really beyond our grasp for many of us, beyond our understanding. I'll be speaking to you again soon. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Roger. Mm -hmm.